I'm Stephen and I'm going to do a small little kind of mini lecture for you based on the stories of a life of a magician. But because we're all magicians, I think we should start off with a trick. I have here my wallet, magician's wallet, because there's nothing in it. But as an interesting thing, you just click your fingers and you can make money appear just like this. Now there's a classic trick in magic where you took 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 pounds and you would go to a magic shop. You would go to somewhere like Alex the shop just here and spend 20 pounds on some wonderful goodies. That would should leave me with 80 pounds. But as a magician, you just click and you have 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 pounds. You could go even further. You could go to somewhere like Castle Magic and spend 20 pounds there. In fact, 40 pounds. I should be left with just 60. Put a click and you get 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 pounds. You can go even further. You could go to somewhere like Practical Magic, spend 20 pounds on one of their dogs, 20 pounds on some rope, and another 20 pounds on a thumb tip, because that's how much they charge. <laughs> and then you click your fingers and end up with 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 pounds all over again. Okay. We can go even further. We'll go to another magic shop. We will go to Taurus Magic. Be careful. He's not in it. Okay, I can spend 20, 40, 60, 80 pounds, and I'll have how much left? 100, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 pounds. But we can go even further than this. We can go to somewhere like World Magic Shop, where you need to take out a mortgage to get through there. But we can spend 20 pounds there, 40 pounds, 60 pounds, 80 pounds. You could even spend full 100 pounds. How much have I got left? No, I've got 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 pounds because I'm a magician. Thank you. I need to do that trick because I don't get paid for this, so it's the, that's the way I do it. Okay, so we're going to look at something called the stories of a life of my magician. A uh, selfish stories of a life of a magician. It's what I do normally when I'm doing WIs and talks, and I'm going to regale you with a few stories. The first story is when I started off in magic, I used to be an illusionist. I used to be a David Copperfield wannabe. I had the long hair, you can even tell in the photo, which is very old. And I used to levitate girls in the air, as you can see here. Now this story starts off when I was about 16 years old and I was hired to do the illusion show at a 60th birthday party. There was a small stage and I went up there and I thought, wow, this is great. I want to use my three big illusions I was doing at the time for my 20 minute set. And I wanted to use smoke pyrotechnics to fill the atmosphere and fill the room. I checked first that it was okay to do it, and they all said it was fine, use the smoke, I was given the go-ahead. So I started my set, did a trick, it was a simple 10-foot pole trick, it wasn't great, but it was, I was 16. And then the smoke came on, filled the room, and the smoke alarms went off. <laughs> now the thing is, nobody knew there were any smoke alarms in the building. So I was continuing, I continued with my show because I was always taught that you've just got to carry on regardless, soldier on through. But after about five minutes of this, nobody was watching me. They were all thinking about these alarms and I have to stop the show. Because nobody knew there were any smoke alarms, nobody knows how to turn them off. So we all break off into search groups and look for some kind of control box to turn the smoke alarms off. Within about five minutes, the first fire engine appears. Three firemen in their uniform come storming in, the fourth one still in the truck, with a hose, ready to put out a fire that's not there. A little tense, we all try and can't tell them that it was a false alarm. That's when two further fire engines turned up. So we had three fire engines in total at this venue for a birthday party. We tell them all, we don't know where the alarm box is, there is no fire. So we try and get in touch with the landlord to get the alarms turned off. We phone up the number we've got, his wife answers, he's on holiday. The landlord, the husband, has gone on holiday to Spain, but the wife is still at home. We ignore that part and just move on. So, okay, can you get in touch with him and find out where the alarm box is and the code is? So we do that, she hangs up, she rings the hotel, who rings up to his room, who he answers from his room, because he's frankly in, and then he rings back to the reception, who rings back to her to tell her where the alarm box is so that she can ring us and then we can turn the alarms off. Half an hour later, 
we finally get the alarms turned off and the fire trucks thankfully leave without charging me. Because as some of you might know, for false call outs, they can fine you. But I was 16, so they took some pity on me. I gave them some puppy dog eyes and they uh, let me off. So I got back on stage and I thought, okay, we've had these fire engines circle the building. What more can we do wrong? You're talking to me here. <laughs> I can make it get worse. So I get back on stage and I do a card trick. First thing is, I lose the card. All I have to do is control a card to the top. Go. In my stressed out state, I think, right, let's just stroke straight to the levitation. I stand there, levitate the girl in the air, and for whatever reason, I step backwards, exposing the cult gimmick underneath me. And the whole levitation is revealed. But I don't know this. I get told this afterwards. So I think everything's going okay. So I let her back down, take a bow, and to walk to the side of the stage. Unfortunately, there's another hour left or two hours of the party, and there's no curtains on this stage, so I can't get my illusion off it without exposing how it works. I don't know, they already know that. So after about half an hour, I finally grab a cloth, throw it over everything, and just wheel it out of there while screeching across the stage, hoping no one really takes any notice of me, and make a stealthy departure. But it does give me this one great line, which I can say at the end of this story, is that I did a trick even the great David Copperfield couldn't do. I produced three fire engines and a puff of smoke. <laughs> I'm gonna reveal, oh thank you, I'll have that round of applause, go on. <laughs> I'm gonna reveal you another story now, that's the story of Britain's Got Talent. Okay, some of you may know the story with me and Britain's Got Talent. Has anyone not heard of it? Quite a few, okay. Well, um, um, okay. Well, I was on the show Series 3, same year as Diversity and Susan Boyle, so I really didn't stand a chance. But, I decided to audition anyway, having heard what they did to Ma uh, Magic Dave and a couple of other magicians. I was going to do this big illusion where I walked through a solid wall. I approached, the first audition is in a small room, up a set of stairs, with just the producer and the cameraman. I have to get this entire illusion up some stairs, which is not easy. The tiny room, I don't understand why we were doing it in there, because if there was a dance group or something, that would never fit. And when I start set up and do my act, the, cat, the producer doesn't watch me. She just, she's there on her phone or something, the entire act. So I do it, think, okay, I get through to the end of it, and that said, thank you, we'll be in touch if we like you. Two months later, I get the phone call to say I've made it to the TV rounds, which is that big stage which you see. On the day, I turn up. I've all got all my energy from me, I've got all the enthusiasm. I have to get there for 7 a.m. in the morning, even though I'm not due on stage until gone past 12. And I sit there in the waiting room uh, with all the other 20 or 40 acts, and nobody comes to me. No Ansel Deck, no Stephen Mulhern, they all, they all don't even give me the time of day. They're talking to everybody, doing interviews, and they completely ignore me. Eventually it's time for me to go up on stage and the stage manager approaches me and tells me that I'm not allowed to put my own illusion on the stage. That he has to do it for me. Now this is odd, but I trust him. You know what, he's a stage manager of the show, they say they don't want to see me before I'm ready to start the set. So I show him where this illusion goes and where this fake hand, which is extremely vital to the trick, where it has to be placed for me to grab it and go straight into the performance. I agree with him beforehand that when I, when I stand on the X, talk to the judges, and turn to face the illusion, I can check that that hand's there before they start the music, and I would give him the thumbs up to say start the go. So, I have to trust him. I have no other choice, I have to do it. Time comes, I stand in front of the X, talk to the judges, Turn around and there's the illusion, it's great, okay. I walk over to it, look down for the fake hand, and it's not there. The fake hand is missing. Now, I spend less than two seconds thinking, what am I going to do? I'm still staring down when the music starts. Now, I never gave anybody the thumbs up. I never told them to start, but it started anyway. Now, my first two tricks were a silk to cane and a rope through neck. So I do those anyway, because they were on me, they couldn't have tampered with that or anything. So I perform those tricks and the audience cheers for me. I actually get the audience cheering 
quite loudly, they all on my side, especially after the rope through neck. And then goes to the illusion of being, what am I going to do here? So I step down behind the wall, just here, and lift up the cloth about this high, where the hand was hidden inside of the cloth, the, the rolls of the cloth itself, and it rolls out behind the wall. Now I think I'm lucky here, because the music could have been started early by mistake. They could have ignored my gesture for this. The hand could have been put in the wrong cloth, in the wrong place by mistake. So for no apparent reason, I'd go up with the cloth and then go back straight down again, grab the hand and come back up. I think I've got away with it. I grab that hand, put it onto this metal pole and let go. And those that know the story know that that hand went jumping off the pole towards the cameras right in front of the stage for everybody to see. Suddenly I had three hands and those buzzers went beep, 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 beep all across the stage. I stood back on my ex having basically failed the illusion and just said, oh, something must have gone wrong, bad luck. Um, and I just tried to make light of it because I didn't want to sound bitter or angry because that's what would have made the edit. I get off stage, finally, Ant and Depp walk up to me and want to give me all these praises and all these hand jokes and things like that. And Stephen Mulhern comes up to me immediately after that and gives me some, what, some more lines to feed me. I just nod and smile and um, they leave. And then I look at the corner of the stage and see the illusion. I walk over there and I see the hand. I pick it up. The magnets that were inside the hand, which stick it to the metal pole, had been taken out, turned around and put back in. So instead of attracting, they repelled. I had physical evidence in my hand. They were held there with white tack. Now, I looked around the stage. I looked for the stage manager. He wasn't there. I looked for any other member of staff. The stage was deserted. There was nobody there. This is in the middle of the show. The entire step backstage had been voided of all staff members. I see one other act coming through the door and I come to my senses and just grab my stuff and wheel it out of the room and just hope they do something good in the edit. I don't know. But it's probably for the best that they didn't, I didn't find anybody that day because it was obvious they were hiding. It was kind of obvious they knew what they were doing and they did it on purpose. But I still think that in the long term plan, it was probably for the best. Because I know several magicians in this room, in fact, who have been on that show. They did a perfect audition and they never made the edit, they never made the TV edit. And I went on there, and yes, I was sabotaged, but I made the TV edit. And that exposure did help. It did give me some kind of recognition for a while. And it still gives me this story, which I'm going to speak about today. And if I go back on the show, which is in question now, because we've already had a magician winner, I've now got a backstory for them to kind of roll off and say, this is what happened, he's coming back for a second time. But if you're wondering whatever happened to that illusion just there, I sold it on a second hand shop. <laughs> I think we should look at another trick just before I go for another story. I want to do something to music. I've been playing around with tricks to music recently. And I'm going to try something here. I think we'll try something with some folks. I'll be creative. Cre um, I'm going to grab someone up to come out and help me. Who should we pick as a, as a victim? Jeff, would you help me please? Please give a round of applause. <laughs> Would you can stand on this side here? Thank you. Would you grab a fork? Any fork you wish. That one's yours. I'm going to ask you to sign it. Would you write your name right across the back of it, just there? This will make it very special because it'll be the only one in the whole world with his name on. Unless you write your name on all the forks at home. And we'll draw a smiley face on this side as well. So we've got your name and a smiley face. But hold up against another one. You should see they're both exactly the same. We're going to do this to music. It goes just like this. Take your finger, just hold it like this.
<laughs> they got through everything. We're going to quickly do one more story, and this story is called Big Babies. I'll leave that picture there when I turn around. Big Babies is a story that I had approximately 10 years ago. I was booked to do a party for a children's birthday party for a fourth year old, and I turn up at a scary hotel that looks just like this. Not exactly the same hotel, but close enough. And it was a pretty scary experience just to even get into the venue. I knock on the door with all my children's show gear, and dressed as a clown at the time, and a person dressed in a giant diaper and one of these hats opens the door. And I think, okay. He invites me in and I get confronted to a room of about 40 adults, all dressed as baby and toddlers. Okay, every one of them is dressed in a costume like one of these, or a little girl. Apparently, it's a part they have their three parties per year. So yesterday they had Easter party, today they're having a Halloween party, and tomorrow they're doing Christmas, this is in the middle of September, and all three days they're dressed as children. And this is their kind of retreat. Which I thought was an interesting uh, way of spending your life. <laughs> So I've been asked to perform a fourth year old birthday party for this group of people, and I do so. I go in there. It's a little bit awkward because, well, they're adults. They don't respond the same way as children. Regardless of how they want to behave and what they want, that's just not what happens. So after about five to 10 minutes, I realize this isn't working. They're not going with the normal kid show stuff. Now I've learned in the past to have adult, stuff, adult show material in my kid show box. So it's not that difficult for me to change and quickly do the normal adult show because they don't know any better anyway. So I get through the one hour show working for this group of quite strange people and continuously I'm looking at this room and thinking, I'm dressed in a clown costume and I'm the most normal person looking here. <laughs> I get to the end of my show and the audience just sit there. I think, okay guys, bye bye. Go, get lost, and they don't go anywhere. I'm, they're kind of stuck. And I'm thinking, I need to, you've got to do something, I need to, I need to pack up. So I see a pass the parcel on the wall, I say, quick, everybody, play pass the parcel. And I make them all play pass the parcel, even though I don't even know if that's what was planned or anything, because they're all behaving like children, including the booker, as though I'm the person in charge. I was like, I still need pain, mate. You know, you've got the money, <laughs> you'll have had that. So I get out there and I get all my stuff out of the room, and it's a kind of a really unusual show to have, but it does mean that when I say I work with children of all ages, I really do mean it. I've got time for one more final trick and then I'm going to get off the stage and let the lecturer set up. For this, I'm going to get rid of these. This is a little bit of an experiment for you guys, actually. You're going to see something brand new. I'm hoping it works. It's a car trick. I know how everybody loves car tricks nowadays. It's going to be a little bit of music. I've been telling a few stories. What I want to do is try and tell a story using the playing card as my narrative device. It's to music, it goes like this. Oh, that's not. <laughs> Go. 